Okay, welcome. This is the Food Resources Mind Map for KQ1, Patterns of Consumption. Please remember, this is to provide an overview of the area. You need to work together with your notes as well as the textbook to flesh out with your own examples as well as evidences. So we'll start by looking at the patterns of consumption. First area that we'll look at is consequences of having variations in food consumption. So in this sector, there are four general areas that we're looking at. Health, economic, social, as well as political factors. In terms of health, when you look at uh, the situation between malnutrition, there are three types of nutrients that we are concerned with. Vitamin A, Vitamin D, and Calcium. For this section here, you need to know what causes a deficiency in these three nutrients in the human body, as well as what are some potential impacts of having such a deficiency. Having a clear understanding of where you will find more people suffering from such deficiencies will be very helpful in providing a full and complete example to your questions. The second area under health that we are going to look at is the condition of starvation. Please remember that starvation is more common in less developed countries, LDCs. However, this doesn't mean that DCs do not have uh, occurrence of starvation. There are always pockets of marginalized people within the DCs that may also be suffering from condition of starvation. One key reason for this being more common in LDCs is primarily LDCs are the one with larger populations. So the two largest LDCs in the world, China and India, combined have over one over 2.5 billion people. So there's a larger chance of this occurring. Second reason is of course the lack of resources to recover from disasters. Being poorer, they have a uh, more likelihood of falling back into a situation where starvation occurs after a disaster. Disasters here can be natural, can be man-made, so please remember that. A third situation that's common in LDCs is a situation where you have unstable political situations, where you have constant conflict or even situations of war, and this leads to uh, inability for the local people to access resources like food. Moving on to the next factor, economic factors. Uh, one key area to look at is, of course, lower productivity. When you are sick, you are unable to be as productive as a healthy individual. Uh, there is also, as a result, for the government side, there's a diversion of financial resources. So when you need to devote more financial resources to your healthcare sector, less can be devoted to other, other sectors like example education or even elder care. Um, and at times, although very, very rarely, uh, other factors like developing your industries may get affected as well. Now, um, when you are dependent on international help, financial aid or food aid, you could also end up in long-term debt situations. Please remember that financial aid doesn't come with out strings attached. There are always conditions. Um, it is not a donation. This money either needs to be returned later on with interest or at the very least needs to be returned later on. One very common condition attached to food and financial aid is that you have to purchase the food from the donor country's companies or companies that are based in the donor country. So actually it helps the donor country boost their own economy. This may come despite your you being able to find a cheaper source of food but uh, the condition exists so you have no choice but to buy the slightly more expensive one from the donor country. The final two factors that we are looking at will be social and political. Uh, political once again is tied a little bit to what we saw earlier with economic where you have social unrest and as a result uh, you are unable to consistently get a uh, constant amount of food for your people. Social unrest when you have uh, cases where there's large social unrest, you may end up having scavenging as a key issue among your population. So these are your factors that you have to consider when you are thinking about consequences of variation in food consumption under patterns of consumption 
in food resources. Next up, we'll be looking at the indicators under patterns of con food consumption. What are the indicators that we can consider to segment these into the different groups? Next up, we'll be looking at the indicators under patterns of con food consumption. What are the indicators that we can consider to segment these into the different groups? One of the key branches that we'll be looking at is how to differentiate between the DCs, developed countries, and the LDCs. And the other branch we're looking at is the indicators of food consumption. Now, for the first one, how do you know, how do you decide who is a DC and who is an LDC? There are two ways to look at it. Firstly, you can look at the economic indicators or alternatively, look at the social indicators. Common examples for developed countries include USA and Japan, whilst for the LDC, uh, you can include countries like Indonesia and Bangladesh. Now, if you talk about economic indicators, GDP per capita is a good indicator uh, it's a simple indicator okay the other one that you can add on is of course about illiteracy rate so the more money that an individual earns in a country or the higher literacy rate indicates they are higher down the road on these as for social indicators you know, we are looking at things like uh, employment opportunity how easy it is, is it for a person to gain employment within the country itself and also a concept of life expectancy which means basically at birth if you live in a country for over a period of 5 to 10 years, what is the expected average lifespan that you are you, you should have being uh, in that location? So if you live in a DC, it will be much longer than LDC. So life expectancy is one of the easiest, way, uh, easiest ways to remember uh, who is the DC, who is the LDC, because we all know the Japanese have the longest high life expectancy. And if you live in a very poor war torn LDC country, for example Afghanistan, your life expectancy could be one third of the Japanese. Next up, we're going to look at the indicators of food consumption. Now, within this, there are five wings that we can look at impact of pricing, changing of food preferences percentage of food components, population growth, as well as political impacts. Now for this, I would like to start with uh, the area of percentage of food components. This is a useful way in deciding uh, whether you are living in an LDC or a DC. Uh, this constitutes the percentile division between your starchy staples, your meat proteins, as well as the fruit and vegetables that you're consuming for your meals. So generally, if you're in a developing country, uh, LDC, the type of labor you're engaged in will require a lot more energy, a lot more hard labor, a lot less uh, white collar jobs. So the general profile of food will be heavy in terms of starchy staples due to the general lower economic status or conditions. Your amount of meat protein may also be lower and it will be topped up using local fruits and vegetables which are cheaper to obtain but the bulk of it will be starchy staples another useful point to highlight here remember i believe we discussed this in class as you get richer people from ldc's the first thing they buy is meat protein so they up their meat protein they reduce the amount of starchy staples they consume because beyond uh, health concerns it is also taken to be a status symbol now, as you move on to becoming a DC, you will then again reduce meat protein once more. So this links us to the second wing, changing food preferences, uh, where the change in your disposable income will directly affect what kind of your what, what percentage of food components you will eat. Okay, uh, food is also taken to be a status symbol. So social, cultural, globalization, the rise of fast food, these are all indicators of uh, rising affluence that people will swap on to. Then lastly, what we talked about earlier, health, the push for organic food. The next wing we're going to look at is of course population growth. Uh, from a logical standpoint, when you have an increasing population, there's a drastic need for more food to feed this population. So there are certain things that we'll talk about subsequently in the chapter on how to attain these more food crops. Okay. Next, looking at political impacts. When you're able to be stable politically, you will have a stable supply of food. So you may, as a choice, political choice, to do two things to stabilize the food supply. Either you increase food imports or you increase food production. 
Now, if you are looking at increasing food production, what we are looking at would be using technology or providing more agricultural land space. Politically, you are also able to plan and hopefully mitigate for destabilizing situations, for example, civil wars or outbreaks of violence. Now, this can be planned for. However, the second one, natural disasters, you cannot preempt. You cannot really do much to stop it. However, you can do preemptive or training or building infrastructure to mitigate the impact of natural disasters. Thirdly, food safety. Uh, it's something that the political system can put in place to ensure that your people have access to safe food. So uh, one of the examples that came up within your textbook was the four steps to keep food safe from refrigeration all the way to uh, overall hygiene standards and making sure that food is cooked properly. Now this is taken for granted in many DCs, however in LDCs this is still far from ideal. Now the last one that we're going to talk about for this area is impact of pricing. Now I need to remind everybody here, when you have a fluctuation in food pricing, it is a problem because you will have rich people having the ability to change their food choice when food prices go up. But the poor people who are already at the bottom of the, the economic scale will starve. So they will adopt uh, undesirable options like scavenging. Now the last one that we're going to talk about for this area is impact of pricing. Now I need to remind everybody here, when you have a fluctuation in food pricing, it is a problem because you will have rich people having the ability to change their food choice when food prices go up. But the poor people who are already at the bottom of the, the economic scale will starve. So they will adopt uh, undesirable options like scavenging. Alright, for the last bit of this um, video, we'll be looking at the impacts of excessive food consumption. Uh, we'll be looking at the three areas that it affects us, health-wise, economic-wise, as well as socially. Um, from a health perspective, when you have excessive food consumption, you're looking at concepts of obesity and its related illnesses, chronic diseases like uh, high blood pressure, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. From an economic standpoint, when a person is suffering from chronic diseases, uh, that individual will of course be less productive than a normal human being. And if the individual happens to be in school, school going age, which is common, which is increasing in, in, in intensity nowadays, uh, productivity in school is lower and it will lead to lower productivity as a working adult. Lastly, from a social standpoint, when you have a case where you have excessive food consumption, it normally comes from a developed country which has uh, overproduction of food. So you have a lot of food wastage and it also spurs on this uh, dieting industry which if done wrongly could lead to very dire consequences as well. The dieting industry is a very big industry in the western world, especially in America. Okay, so we'll stop the video here. Please stay tuned for part 2, which will be launched very soon. Uh, hope this helps you form a larger scaffold. Please remember to refer back to your notes and your textbooks for more details and examples and of course explanations. Good luck.